Okay, hello, hello, welcome back after the break. And yeah, it's a great honor to announce Chris Pisopo. I don't know how to introduce somebody like that. Everybody knows him, he has such a long biography. I think that would be by itself a fill for a whole session. Um, Chris is a CTO and co founder of Faircode, and he will take us to, as what I understand, a brief review on the, how we went from outsider to allies. I think other people, Break about 15 years experience, 20 years experience. Chris was with rich, 25 years of experience in the AppSec industry or security industry. I saw some slides, some uh, teasers. I'm looking forward. With no further ado, please, Chris, take the stage. Th thank you, Martin. It's uh, great to be here. Um, I'm happy to uh, be here on this 20th anniversary. Um, and it's just, it's amazing to me that it's, it's been 20 years since OAuth started, even though I started doing this as a vulnerability researcher before there even was really an AppSec concept. Um, and so today I wanna talk about the relationship between application security and development teams. Um, I think it's vastly improved over time. And as William Gibson has said, the future is unevenly distributed. So I think we can learn from the past and learn from those um, that are already living in the, in the future. So just a, to start off, a few things people might not know about me um, that I think really were formative and helped me um, learn about software security and testing. And uh, I guess to start off, because I know people will ask this question, um, that, that's me on the telephone in 1987 um, when I was a co-op student working for IBM in Boca Raton. I visited Key West, and that's the southernmost telephone uh, in the United States. I don't know if it's still there anymore. Um, but um, I wanted to talk about a few things people don't know about me because I think they made a difference in um, me going down this path and um, trying to make software more secure. And one of the things is my very first job after I did my co-op and graduated from, from college, um, my first job was writing automated software testing tools at, at a software vendor. So my job was to do things like write you know, inputs into uh, programs and record what the screen was supposed to look like. And if it didn't, if it didn't look like that, something, something was wrong. If an error message came up or an error message didn't come up, things like that. And so it's the very first thing I did as a software engineer was test, uh, was test other software. So right away, I got an understanding for how important that was. Um, now, this was totally functional QA testing. There was nothing, there was no concept of security testing back then because really nothing was even networked. Um, so, so, but um, I had to work with the development team, right? I had to work with the QA team and it was important to, you know, serve their needs um, to ship good software. Um, another thing that uh, a lot of people I don't think know is my, my father worked for over 20 years for GE Aircraft Engines and he was a materials engineer and he worked in a non-destructive testing lab, um, which is another way of saying static analysis. Um, because of course you're gonna test jet engines by running them by um, all kinds of other um, you know, dynamic testing. But he taught me about static testing. He taught me about how they could um, use x-rays um, to look at casted parts to see if there were any uh, fractures in those parts um, before they would assemble, assemble uh, the machine. And if you could find a, a, a poor casting early in the process um, by just doing an x-ray of it, that saved you a lot of time and money because you could just throw that part away and you didn't have to um, uh, find out later down the line where maybe something would break and you would waste a lot of time and, and other parts um, by doing dynamic testing. So I thought it was pretty interesting 
um, the concept of static uh, static testing. And this was this was you know 20, 20 years ago he was talking about this. And the other thing was the supply chain. The supply chain of the suppliers that made a lot of the parts that they assembled was critical, and they were always looking for better suppliers. And if a supplier started to, you know, put out poorer quality, they started to they switched to another supplier. And I think that is something that makes a lot of um, there's a lot of analogies to that today with using open source and even just using commercial software. Um, and then finally. Um, one of the things I did early on in my career as, a, as an AppSec professional was um, do consulting at, uh, at Microsoft. And together with Microsoft, when I was at At Stake, um, I tested IAS, Exchange, uh, SQL Server. And the interesting thing was these were the first time that Microsoft was having outsiders come in to look at security. Um, so there was a lot of learning going on on, on, on both sides. Um, so to go back to the beginning, um, you know, I started as part of a hacker group, um, the, the Loft, and uh, we were clearly outsiders. And I, I put that's the uh, that's the movie poster for the movie, The Outsiders. And no, that's not Tom Cruise and Matt Dillon there um, and Patrick Swayze. That's that's uh, my fellow hackers, Mudge and Dill Dog and Space Rogue at uh, at the Loft. And just the virtue of being a hacker is you're, you're inherently an outsider, right? Um, you're not part of the organization running the software, not part of the organization building the software. You're inherently an outsider. And um, being an outsider isn't, isn't necessarily bad. There's, there's some good things to being an outsider. Um, we were able to say the emperor has no clothes, which what we meant was you know companies like Microsoft weren't doing security testing. We could call them out and we could say they can do better. They're, they're not doing a good job. You couldn't necessarily do that if you worked at Microsoft. And maybe you couldn't even do that if you were a, a, a customer um, uh, from, from a bank or someone using their software, because um, you would just, it wouldn't, you would, your, your supervisors, your peers probably wouldn't look at you too well if you, if you did that. That was the mindset uh, back in the 90s. So it was a bit of a privilege to be able to have this alternative view on software security and call them out when they said, hey, our product is secure. It takes this many, you know, thousands of years to crack our passwords. We would say, actually, no, your passwords are insecure. This is why you're using crypto wrong. Or um, you, they would say, you know, we have all these great, you know, security features. And we would say it really doesn't matter because your code is riddled with buffer overflows. So there was, there was a certain um, uh, position to be in. I think that was important, being an outsider. But um, the, the problem with being an outsider, though, is you really can't affect change, right? It's, it's, hard, it's hard to affect change um, being, being an outsider. But you can certainly um, put out information out there into the world that people can think about. Um, so here is my very first uh, piece of vulnerability research I ever did um, from 1996. Um, I was playing around with Lotus Domino, which was a web application. It was taking Lotus Notes and giving it a, um, you know, a web interface so you could use it through a browser instead of a fat, excuse me, a fat client. And um, I was playing around with it and playing with the URLs as, as, as you do when you're doing um, web, web attacks. And I realized that um, they had broken um, access control. Um, I didn't know it was called broken access control. We didn't have the OS top 10 or CWE back then. So I just, I just had to um, describe it as data can be edited or deleted if permissions are not set properly, which is a little bit confusing. Um, but the idea was you could, uh, you could just change the URL and get edit or delete um, capabilities on, on, different, on different documents. Um, so here we are, you know, 25 years later, and what's the new number one for, for the uh, OWASP top 10? Um, it's broken access control. So uh, the very first vulnerability I found and published um, is the number one vulnerability today 
25 years later. Um, that, that's kind of a sad state of affairs, um, really. Um, it was number five in the 2017 um, top 10. Um, so we know about this problem really well, right? Knowledge about the problem isn't solving the problem. Um, testing for this problem is still, is still a challenge. It's still a challenge to, to find these types of vulnerabilities. And I don't think we're very, we're very good at it. Um, but something happened um, after I published this vulnerability. Um, Lotus actually acknowledged this on their, um, on their homepage. Lotus uh, described the problem, described how they fixed it, gave me credit. Um, and thanked and thanked me. And this was completely out of the blue. Like we had no expectation that, that this would happen. So there, there was a sense that some developers actually appreciated um, vulnerability research, even way back in 1996. Um, so that, that, was, that was interesting. And it made us sort of think, hey, maybe, maybe we should talk to developers. And they actually invited uh, me and Mudge, who was also at the loft at the time, um, to come and give a presentation to their development team and teach them about what we were doing to find these, to find these vulnerabilities. And so this is way back in, in 1996, was sort of the first time we said, hey, maybe, maybe we can work with these development teams and, and, and we, can, we, can help, we can help them. Um, but it wasn't always so ro rosy. Um, there was a lot of confusion um, of what we were doing at the loft with our vulnerability research. And I think there was a ton of articles that were written that had headlines like the one you see here that started with hackers from loft break. And instead of saying, you know, broke, you know, uh, you know, a, a web server software or Internet Explorer, they'd say things like hackers from Loft break into Microsoft. Um, and, and so this, this confusion of what we were doing, even though we were attacking software and doing software uh, vulnerability research, there was the, 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 the mainstream and even the technical world didn't really understand what we were doing and why this was important. Um, and, and thought we were actually, um, you know, breaking into different organizations and, you know, reporters would ask us, why are you even tell, why are you talking about this? Why are you telling the world that you broke into Microsoft? And so there was, there was a lot of confusion in the beginning about what vulnerability research uh, e even was. I, I don't think it helped that, you know, we came from a hacker group and we used our hacker names and our website pages were black. Um, that that cer certainly didn't 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 help. They thought we were sort of up to no good, um, but but we thought we were doing something, you know, in, in important at the time. Um, but then as time progressed a little bit, um, it started the the vendors started to understand what we were doing, and we weren't doing this to make them look bad or 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 with some sort of criminal or even a hacktivist um, in, intent. Um, it was truly to look at what software vulnerabilities were out there in software, get an understanding of that, the scope of that, the impact of that, and also you know, give advice to these uh, software vendors. And around 1997, which I think was the first year of Black Hat, um, this start, it started to shift a little bit. It started to shift that software vendors were interested in, in learning more from us. And we had a meeting, the Loft guys had a meeting with, with Microsoft. And um, we, we told them about how we were finding vulnerabilities in the SMB protocol and their cryptography and how we were doing this by setting up you know, a lab environment and sniffing the network and you know, doing packet injection, and 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 you know, later this was automated as fuzzing, but back then we would just kind of do it manually, um, and you know, basically lots of negative testing, and Microsoft was quite interested in this, and 
after we talked to them, uh, we were talking to this reporter at the E Times describing what we were doing. And uh, he um, uh, wrote this article for EE Times, which was a technical uh, magazine, um, about uh, how um, what we were doing was important and, and, and how we were trying to help people improve their products and coming up with a process of improving the security of your product by breaking into it. So this was taking all those testing techniques and having the, de the developer of the software do those things instead of you know, waiting till attackers did that. And then of course um, they, they, would patch, they would patch it. But there's still sort of, as you can see from the picture and the language, there's sort of this, sort of this still this sort of outlaw outsider thing um, going on. But I think the thing that really changed from the outsider and um, hacker um, world was when we started to interact with, with Microsoft more. And we started to, when we released vulnerabilities, um, something happened in 1997. And that was Microsoft approached us and said, you know what, guys, I know you're doing interesting stuff and you want to publish your research, but um, if you just contacted us first, we would, we, would, uh, we would fix the issue and then you could publish, um, you know, describing what you did and what you found after we fixed the issue. And this would actually fix, um, this would protect our customers. And this is really, I think, this was, this was the thing that really started to change things, that vulnerability research wasn't an outlaw uh, activity. It was actually doing, it was doing something that vendors wanted to coordinate with, that vendors wanted to work with. And Microsoft really was the first one out there. Oh, it looks like I got a pop up there. Um, so let's see what's happening. Um, so Microsoft really kind of put out there that they wanted to work with us um, first. And I think that went a long way in what happened next, which I think completely changed us from being outlaws to being, you know, people used to call us, oh, you're now white hats. Now you're not, you're sellouts. Now you're working for the man. And that was when we testified um, as a group, as the loft, um, at a U.S. Senate hearing in, uh, in 1998. And this was about three and a half years before uh, OWASP was founded. And I think this, this woke the world up to the concept of, um, you know, pe people need to work with, with people doing vulnerability research. Like this is something that software vendors need to work with government needs to work with. Um, and this really was the bridge between being an outsider and starting to be someone who's, who's working with people that are building, um, build, building software. Now, the interesting thing was the whole reason we were brought in by the Senate to testify was because they wanted an outsider view. They didn't want the government accounting office view. They didn't want a government funded think tank view. Um, Although Peter Neumann testified with us from, you know, from SRA and obviously a, a, a guy who knows a lot about um, software failures and, and software security failures, they really wanted to hear what we had to say because we were total outsiders. We were coming at this as independent outsiders. And um, they even let us use our hacker names. You can see that we have Weld Pond, they, I have Weld Pond there. Um, but this is this is this really pushed it pushed it forward, and we started to think at the loft. This is when we said we need to do this as as a living. Like we need to we need to become application security professionals. Like we 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 should figure out how to do this as a business, or join forces um, to to do this as a company. And a couple of years later, um, we we helped found a, a, an application security company at stake and, and started to be consultants that the whole point was to work with people building, um, building software. 
And after At Stake was formed, um, a couple other companies like Foundstone, um, where I think Mark Curfee worked at the time when he founded um, um, o OWASP worked. And um, in um, this, 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 I'm gonna put up the note here uh, that uh, Mark Curfee put out to bug track, which is the way that we all communicated back then on a, on a mailing list, announcing um, the launching of, of OWASP with a website and um, a mailing list. And he talked about um, you know, having a, a technical committee and he brought together some of the people who were some of the pioneers working on how do we do this AppSec thing at the time. John, John Viega, myself, Greg Hoagland, Elias Levy, who was the moderator of um, BugTrack at the time, and brought us together to you know, form, help, form, help form this organization um, of OWASP. Um, and so that's, I think that's, that's where you know, the outsider part of being a complete outsider, a hacker, ends. But unfortunately, um, as, as you probably all know and have all experienced, even when doing this professionally, even when doing it for hire, um, there's this feeling that, and especially in the beginning, that um, people doing application security are, are, are outsiders to the software development process. Um, I think for a long time, we felt that we were outside looking in and really not part of, 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 of the team. You know, we were, we were essentially critics. We were not part of the creation process. You know, a critic who, um, you know, talks about, you know, maybe how a movie script is bad or the directing is bad or cinematography is bad or the plot is bad um, is a critic that, you know, does that after the movie is, is, is done. And that's a lot of the ways that early application security was. Uh, it was brought in at the end of the process after something was built and it really felt like we were movie critics. We weren't the director. We weren't part of the process where the director might be coaching or, or helping an actor get something right. We weren't part of the creation process. We were, we were on the outside and being on the outside is, is, is pretty limiting. You can say smart things, um, but, um, and maybe the director will take that and, and, and think about it for the next movie, but you didn't make that movie much better, right? Um, you, because, it, because it was done. And, and a lot of the early, early AppSec was still like that. Even though we were getting paid to do that, we were brought into the end of the process. It was very limiting limited the impact um, we could make. And that had to change in order for, 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 for software security to get better. Um, so uh, a, a year or so after OWASP, or actually I think it was only a few months after OWASP was formed, um, there was the famous Bill Gates trusted computing memo. And this is where Bill Gates basically said, um, Microsoft is going to build secure software. We're going to stop what the, everything we're doing. We're going to train our developers, and they're going to write secure code. We're going to we're going to build secure software, and they kicked that off. And um, they quickly realized they didn't really know how to build secure software. You know, there was a few books and there was some things out there, but you know, there wasn't really a guide that they could they could read um, or send their developers to training for back in 2002. So they realized they needed someone on the outside to come in. Um, so again, this is still outsiders, but they were trying to bring them into their environment to work with their development teams. And so first Microsoft hired Foundstone to come in and help them build secure software, work with their development teams. And later, they brought in at stake, which was where I was working at the time, and I, I came in um, to do consulting. Uh, and then once at stake was there, I found out that Foundstone had gotten gotten kicked out, um, and they had essentially replaced Foundstone with at stake. And I had heard why was because Microsoft didn't want someone who looked like an outsider, and the Foundstone 
employees were all wearing their Foundstone branded, you know, uh, golf shirts. And they, they showed up and they had these black shirts that said Foundstone and they walked around and they say, oh, the Foundstone guys are here working on this project. So they were told to blend in and dress like Microsoft employees and not, and not look like they're coming from the outside because Microsoft really wanted to integrate um, the consultants into the teams together, working side by side on the same team. And we were told that we had to dress like Microsoft employees, that we couldn't wear any branded logos. And we couldn't, uh, when, 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 our, when our CEO came to visit, he wasn't allowed to wear a tie. He was supposed to look like a senior manager at, at Microsoft and, and they didn't wear ties uh, to work. Um, so, uh, you know, this is just a stepping stone in the way, even when you're hiring consultants, trying to make it feel like it's, it's part of one team. So this is really an important journey that, that AppSec is on. Um, so, but when we were there, um, you know, we didn't have any really any automated tools on the, in the beginning. Um, mostly we did threat modeling and code review. Um, and that was, that was pretty slow. Um, but, you know, threat modeling was super important, even if it was slow, because Microsoft didn't have any way of understanding their, their uh, design flaws. They just didn't have any way of doing that. And threat modeling was a way um, of doing that. It also helped us understand where the risky, where the risky code was. Um, if something was you know, protecting something from a different you know, security domain, um, that was probably a critical, uh, a critical area of code. So we did a lot of code review. We did a lot of threat modeling. And of course, we, you know, we taught uh, hands-on with the teams. This wasn't like we would just do a report. We would do it with them. Um, we, we were working together um, with the developers. So I think Microsoft actually got this pretty early on that security needed to be embedded in the process and, um, and, and, and security trained people had to be part of the team. Um, and then while we were there, actually, Dave Itell was part of the team and he started writing a tool called Spike because he had this concept of fuzzing um, that he wanted to do. So we were off doing um, threat modeling and reviewing code and Dave is writing a fuzzer. Um, and we only had about two weeks left on the engagement. And we said, Dave, you're not gonna find any vulnerabilities if you're just writing a tool. And uh, he said, just wait, just wait. Once I'm done, I'm gonna find so many vulnerabilities quickly because I've, I'm automating the process that you guys are doing um, by doing it. And, and actually Dave finished his tool a couple days before our engagement was over. And he was right. He found lots and lots of vulnerabilities um, by automating the process. So this is around you know, 2003 or so, and the light bulbs are starting to go on that you know, we're gonna, we're gonna have to automate, automate this stuff. Um, you know, everything, everything was, was, was too slow. And the idea was build tools, you know, that developers could, could use. Uh, I think the problem was in the beginning, developers didn't wanna use the tools. And so AppSec people use the tools. So we were using the tools. We had all this great automation, DAST and SAST and fuzzers. Um, but we, we were the ones using the tools and they weren't designed for developers. They were designed you know, for experts. And this, this, this kept the gap um, and kept us as outsiders because of the design point of the tools. And maybe it's just that those are the only people that would use them back then. Um, but uh, the tools were AppSec friendly, right? They found lots of issues. They were false positive friendly. I'd rather weed through false positives than, than miss a false negative, right? So that's just the AppSec mentality. It's like, I'm willing to do a lot of work just to find that one more flaw. Clearly, this is not what developers want to do because they wanted to ship code. And this having, having powerful tools that found a lot of issues, the problem was it was a lot of issues and success was just finding flaws. So there really was this separation and we're sort of going backwards here with automation in joining forces with the development team. Um, we're, 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 uh, 
we're, we're feeling success is finding flaws. And this is clearly not success for the development team, right? They want to ship and they want to fix bugs. They don't want to just find more bugs. So um, I feel like there might've been a bit of a step backward in the early days um, of, of automation. And, and so, you know, so if I think if we go back 10 years, um, you know, we got all these great educational documents, we got all these great tools, but they really weren't focused on developers. They were really focused on, 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 on the AppSec practitioner. And um, that, that really led to a, a place where we are focused on finding, finding issues and just finding problems and finding more and more problems. But then a change starts to happen because this can't go anywhere from here, right? We can't just keep finding more issues. We really need to work with developers to help them fix code or prevent the flaws in the first place. So I think about 10 years ago, we started to see things change and we started to see a focus um, come to fixing um, issues. And there became an emphasis on training developers and uh, an emphasis on presenting good remediation advice and sample fixes. And we start to see OWASP projects like ES uh, API and other secure libraries as building blocks that are focused on building secure code, not, not finding, um, not, not, not processes to yet find more um, issues. And uh, this is where I think we start to get to, you know, modern, modern AppSec, um, which I'm much happier um, to be a part of now than AppSec maybe in its first 10 years. Um, and, and I think it's a, it's a better place for, for, for everyone, everyone to be. It's not distributed evenly. Um, there's still places where uh, AppSec and development don't don't get along, um, and there's still places where AppSec teams are all focused on on, on finding finding problems. Um, but the next part I want to talk about is, you know, how do how do we learn to to solve that problem? And I, I think one of the best things that ever happened to AppSec was development processes changing to agile and then um, DevOps, because we became obsolete as a separate security team, right? It, it just, it wasn't going to work um, if, if we had to have a window of time where testing and fixing, fixing happened. The code was just moving too quickly. And just like QA um, and release got folded into an agile process, um, security started to get folded into the agile process. And, and developers got trained uh, up so high, they became security champions. And we even started to have, um, you know, people writing, um, you know, security engineers writing unique test cases, um, actually writing code and libraries right alongside as, as part of the development teams. So um, this was really a forcing function, I feel, to really modernize the way uh, AppSec, AppSec was, was working. And um, in 2017, um, I was um, at uh, AWS um, reInvent and I saw uh, uh, Werner Vogels, the uh, Amazon CTO, and he came up and he gave a presentation um, and uh, on the evolving developer mindset. And uh, what, what he said, I thought it, it just blew me away. I'm like, this guy gets it. Amazon gets it. Um, this is where we need to go. And, you know, these are his exact, this is his quote. Security is everyone's job now, not just the security teams. With continuous integration and continuous deployment, all developers have to be security engineers. We move too fast for there to be time to review security by the security team beforehand. It needs automation. It needs to be integrated into its process. Each and every piece should have security integrated into it. So um, this is where uh, Amazon, you know, was leading. A lot of other companies were starting to do the same thing, and it really 
you know, back, this was, you know, four years ago, but this is where a lot of companies are now. And, you know, I, I see development and security completely, you know, um, you know, converging and both taking the best of each other's skill sets and tool sets. It's about developers performing security practices and security professionals building software and, and writing and writing code. Security as code, policy as code. Um, and, and so both of us are learning from each other, developers and security professionals, and, and truly becoming and becoming one team. And so this again isn't everywhere, but where this is happening, that is where I feel that um, you're getting the most secure, the most secure software. So I, I feel like in, in lots of places, we really are finally um, allies. Um, developers are not on their own. Success is being part of that team that's shipping secure code on schedule. Um, there's work to continually improve the process, better tooling, um, better integrations, shifting left. It feels like continuous improvement, like there's continuous um, progress being made. And that means less work to get to the same secure outcome, getting better at um, getting to that um, secure code. So some of the things that I've seen make this work um, is really building those, excuse me, relationships um, at the peer level, you know, CISO or product security um, leader to, or AppSec leader to, um, you know, VP of engineering, um, you know, security practitioners, AppSec um, engineers and developers, working together, meeting with them, understanding each other's goals, being sympathetic to each other's, each other's struggles. So really an understanding, um, and that's, that's what you need to become one team. And part of that is shared accountability. You need to have shared accountability. It has to be part of the goal of both teams to ship secure code on time. You know, part of security's goals should be how are we enabling the development team not to slow down? And part of security's goals is how are we enabling more the AppSec team to test better? And, and, and how are we able to you know, follow their guidance or even auto remediation? So it, it's, a, it's, it's accountability um, and it's gotta be measured and, and, re and reported on. So um, I have a few slides here that are how we've seen processes improve across our customers um, at Vericode. And um, we, we took a look at this and we, we had to split the process improvements uh, across um, two, different, two different domains. And we realized that some applications, um, just by their very nature, um, are going to be harder to secure. Um, and some are going to be easier to secure. So we wanted to look at what processes can be used to secure the hard ones and the easy ones. So we looked at the nature of applications and we looked at what's, what's an ideal environment for an application to be secure. It's a small application with a small organization, a low flaw density, and it's, it's relatively new. That's just easier to secure. Um, and, and what are those less ideal environments? It's a large organization. It's a large application. It's old. There's a lot of legacy code. It has a high flaw density. That's much harder to, to improve, but there are improvements we can do for those, those different types of Application. So we call that the nature of the application. That's our starting point. But then there's the nurturing um, part. What is what is it, what does the ideal team do um, to nurture application security? Regular, frequent scanning, variety of ways of testing the application. Um, and then you know what are what are what are poor ways of doing this? Just using one technique, like just using static analysis, um, and then just doing this on an annual basis or a quarterly basis or irregular intervals, like don't do it for a few months and then do it intensely right before you ship the code. So those are some of the things we've seen be better or worse with the way people are using, you know, Vericode's automated testing. 
and we took all the different things that we've seen um, our, our customers do, and we rank them by um, what's helping um, and, and what's hurting um, remediation time. So what's making it easier to fix a bug and what's making it harder to fix a bug. And we wanna learn what makes things easier to fix flaws because it's of course, let, let's do more of that. It's great to prevent them with libraries and, and developer training, but at the end of the day, you're going to have flaws um, just like you have quality and performance flaws and you need to deal with them. So what are, what are the ways that we found changes the average remediation time? So we saw that if people are using multiple testing techniques like DAST and SAST, on average, that makes it 24.5 days between discovery of a vulnerability and the um, fixing remediation of that vulnerability, 20, 24.5 days quicker on average. Scanning more frequently, um, you know, so moving from maybe a monthly basis to uh, a weekly or daily basis made it so that it was 22 and a half days quicker on average to fix a vulnerability. Um, using APIs, which I think is a proxy uh, to, to call your testing, a proxy for integrating it into your CI, CI pipeline or your IDE. So that's shifting left and getting more continuous. We saw that people that used our APIs versus, versus people who just sort of uploaded their application to us and did it you know, once every once in a while. We found that the, the API usage, people were fixing their vulnerabilities 17 and a half days on average quicker. Doing, a, doing scans in a steady way instead of bursty, 15 and a half days. And teams that used um, uh, SCA, uh, software composition analysis, even if it was something that um, you know, wasn't necessarily fixing, it, it wasn't the flaws that were, it wasn't finding vulnerable libraries, just teams that were using that, maybe it showed maturity, um, but they were fixing things six days faster than average. And then the bad news was if your app is older, just by the fact that it's being older, it's gonna take you three days on average longer to fix flaws. If you're coming from a large organization, it's gonna take you 14 days on average. A large application is, is really just the worst, right? Um, uh, that was 57 days later to remediate on average. And just a high flaw density, which I think is, you know, legacy code, or perhaps using languages like C++, which have a higher flaw density, or PHP, which has a higher flaw density. That 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 took longer on average to fix a flaw. So we like to try to learn from process and and see how we can recommend to to people how to how to improve their process. Um, and then this is just a chart to just show you the data of um, of how we did this, and um, you know, you can see that um, even with it was a good environment, taking good actions reduced the half-life of a flaw from 25 days to 13 days. So even if you're in that great environment of you know small application, new code, small team, taking the actions of you know using APIs to call testing, integrating it in, um, using multiple testing types can pretty much cut your remediation time in, in half from people who aren't doing that. That was really, really good news. Um, but the bigger difference is for the people that are coming from a poor environment. Um, they uh, can in increase the, the half-life by four months. So it's a little hard to see on the chart, but I think we're going from on average around um, uh, about uh, 10 months on average to fix a, to remediate a flaw once it's found to six months. So just changing your process, no matter what kind of environment you, you have to, to Im embed, um, you know, AppSec process and people into your team is going to, isn't going to make a, is going to make a huge difference. So now in the last couple of minutes, I just want to talk about, you know, the, the future. Um, where, where, where are we going? Where is OWASP going? I think the one of the big things that we're seeing happening is, is supply chain, both on the micro level, which is, you know, libraries and components and packages developers are using, and on the macro level, 
you know, what relationships does your organization have, whether it's buying a SaaS application, using external APIs, um, um, just what, what software are you purchasing? And um, we're seeing that OWASP is, has been on the leading edge of, of supply chain for, for a while with, you know, first dependency checker, now dependency check and dependency track and Cyclone DX. These are all things that, um, you know, the SBOM, excuse me, project is looking at and, and the new government uh, standards we're gonna see coming down um, are, are looking at as, as, as leading ways of managing supply chain risk and a, the ASVS project to, to look at a supplier and say, you know, what have they done um, to secure their application? So I, I think we're, we're, we're doing well on, um, you know, building our own software. We, we know what to do. We're, we're not all there yet. Um, and I think now it's looking externally um, is, is really part of the big future of, of, of AppSec, both on the micro and macro level. Um, and, and there's no better example of that than the you know, extremely slow moving federal government getting on board um, with uh, President Biden's cybersecurity executive order from May, which is gonna hold vendors um, accountable to delivering secure software. And NIST is um, going down this process. Um, I've been taking part in these these workshops and call for papers. And I, I see a lot of other OWASP people um, taking part in it. Um, and, and it's starting to make progress as a definition of critical software is released. Um, the initial minimum standards for supplier is, is, is released. And um, there's been workshops on IoT labeling and, and software labeling to start to make it so that a, a purchaser of software can easily see um, what, what's been done to, to secure their software. So um, I think that's, that's pretty exciting and um, it's been quite a journey um, for application security from outsiders to allies. And I'm, I'm happy to be, um, to have started as an outsider and, and now be an ally now. And I know a lot of you uh, out there are. Um, so with that, I, I thank you for uh, in, inviting me to, to come and speak um, and I'm happy to be, be be, have been part of OWASP for, for, for a lot of time. So with that, uh, I don't know, Martin, um, I'll turn it back to you. Yes, Chris, thanks. Um, great talk. And definitely uh, the experience you shared that you have with your customers, definitely we have become allies. Uh, I think it's a weird thing for me because I also, as you have been a developer before I became a security specialist. I think yeah, so you see definitely the difference when you approach them. Many times when I was a consultant, that people were like crossing the arms, leaning back, like, oh, you're the security guy testing my application. It's like they're expecting you coming in with the security stick and hitting that. Just by saying, like, no, I'm, what do you expect me to do? Like, you, your team worked on the software for months, and now I should sprinkle security on it? So I will be the crowbar to help you to make it more secure. And then you get an interest. And I think it's really bad that I fight it when people say that, uh, Software developer would not be interested in security. I think the software, they are the security, I would like to hear your state, the security uh, industry kind of made security unwanted because we said it's expensive and complex. When you have a software project, you don't want to have anything that costs time or money. And what do you think? It's, it's I think, kind of self inflicted not to be liked by software developers, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I think. I think if we had come at it right away with, um, you know, we, we, we don't want to do anything to slow you down and speed is more important than accuracy. We'll get better accuracy over time, but the speed's the more important thing. I think we would have had a better audience with the developers. I know it goes against everything that you believe deep down as a security professional. What do you mean? Like speed over accuracy? Um, um, but you have to start with, 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 where, with where someone's willing to accept you, and then you can improve the accuracy over time. If you hold to the accuracy side of the equation, um, you, you're just kind of stuck there. So um, it, it's, 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 
it's been a challenge because our mindsets are 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 are, are so different about about what we we feel is Im- important. Um, but I, I think that now we're we're part of the team and we understand what they're accountable for, and and what they feel is important. Now we get some acceptance, right? We get the acceptance first on the team, and then we can say, you, you know what? Maybe we should be fixing the mediums too, and not just the highs. Well, how can we do that and not slow down? Well, let's figure it out. Let's figure out how to do that, or let's. Let's do some more testing with multiple techniques to find more high issues. But isn't that going to be more to fix? No, we're going to do it in a way that um, it's not going to slow down your release. So I think it's starting It's starting wanting to be a, a peer and then bringing, bringing in. And, um, and, and, and I think that we're making a lot more progress now with that kind of attitude. I, I see that, of course, teams are becoming more agile. It's, uh... Uh, and more flexible and DevOps and pushing left. But I still see that a lot of security departments, they have struggled to understand what DevOps means. It's just, like, oh, they want to be quick and dirty. What do you see? Do you see some development in how we can see this development and security becomes more agile? And what can we do to pull them along? Yeah, so I, I think just if you just look at, you know, Agile and DevOps as just being faster, you're, you're kind of missing part of the of the point, and that's sort of a shallow view of it. It really is that that continuous process, right? Like seeing a manual step and and saying, "Hey, I can I can automate that," or seeing something, an artifact that's not well managed, and saying, "Hey, if I put that in revision control, I can manage it better." So there's there, part of the DevOps process is just continuous process improvement of, 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 of you're going faster because you're improving your process, not because you're dropping things on the floor and just not doing anything anymore. So I, I think once you start to understand that, you start to, you start to say, well, how can, we get, how can we get security to fit into that um, and, and, and how we can get it to be continuous, and um, and and something that's fully automated, and 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 doesn't um, dis- it doesn't disrupt things, right? So like disruption is bad. So how can you plan for sort of micro man- manual tasks? And and it's it's working with the development team to figure out how to do process improvement, um, not just get faster. And I, I think the process improvement way of thinking about it is. Is um, is more real? Is is really what it, it it it's all about? It's that it's those predictable, repeatable outcomes, and and making security uh, a predictable, repeatable, a repeatable outcome. And I, I think that's the the way to think about it. And so the longer you hang with the DevOps team, the more the more you start to get this. Yeah, I think it's definitely it's about enterprise quality, and I think we have to realize that. And- just saying that if they don't want it, yes, then maybe your message is wrong. And I totally understand, uh, uh, encourage what you said uh, on the line, what you said, that they're not a uh, security tool. I see so many times that security department purchases a uh, static code and it's a dynamic code, whatever tool, and they put it up on the developers. Or even worse, they manage it, and developers have to wait until the security comes with the report. You know, it's, it's so unfortunate that uh, maybe we should also not only go to development and talk, also to the compliance people and talk there as well. Uh, you know, a- absolutely. So it's great to be here at OWASP. Um, but I, I, I find when I speak to people, you know, on the development side of the world, I, I, I think it's actually more, more, more important because when we come into their world, we're showing them like, we want to understand your problems. We want you to understand what we can potentially do for you. And it's coming to sort of their, their environment. I think compliance can, you know, it can, it can be the same way. I know a lot of us have an aversion to compliance. Uh, I mean, I started as an engineer myself, so I get along with engineers better than I do compliance people. Um, but uh, that's another, I think that's a great point. That's another bridge that, that has to be crossed because it's really easy for compliance people to, you know, put down hard, hard, hard lines 
um, and not try to try to figure out how you can you know do both, right? How how can you be compliant and be be agile? Um, and that you know that's that may be even more of a challenge than working with the development team. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Uh, Thank you for being here at our anniversary at conference. Uh, for everybody, uh, Chris will be staying at a, a keynote uh, channel. It's trendies any keynotes uh, when you have questions. Uh, then we will go after to other tracks. Thanks again, Chris. I look forward to, to meet you in person again. It's, whatever you have at tools, personal meetings, they cannot be replaced. And uh, thanks for having you. Thanks a lot, Mark. Have a great day, everyone.